Getter anyone but Biden. 2024 merch. Stu does merch.com. Use the code Stu10 to save 10%. If you're watching on YouTube, like this video right now. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Do all the things. We appreciate it. Sarah Gonzalez is here with the latest on the attempted impeachment of the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson and why it matters to the rest of the country. Hunter Biden sues the IRS which seems like a solid way of taking attention off his recent indictment for gun charges. But we start by doing the future of life. Ah, yes. You know, we've been in this very lengthy uh, back and forth over the issue uh, of abortion for, I don't know, 50 some odd years. And then we finally got to the end of that chapter with the Dobbs decision and the overturning of Roe versus Wade. By the way, 62422, the date that that happened, that merch is also available at studosmerch.com. Uh, use the code STU10 to save 10% on that. It's a great one uh, to have around, and no one knows what it is. Like, the, uh, anyone but Biden, like, it looks like a pro-Biden thing until you get close, and then people get disappointed or happy, depending on where they come from. And then the other one, 62422, they have no idea what that is. And then they ask you what it is, and then you get to tell them what it is, which is also uh, a fun thing. Because, you know, a bunch of babies being born that wouldn't otherwise have been born is something to celebrate. Not to be upset about, but that's what the media and the left want you to be. And we're now having a moment of debate within the Republican Party. Because, to be fair, as you know, I'm a pretty big pro-life guy. Uh, to be fair, there is a conversation on the right as to how to deal with the issue of abortion now that Dobbs has gone through. What do we do? How does this affect the right? How does this uh, affect conservatives? There's a lot of questions going on about that. There have been uh, many uh, states that have tested this already, and most of them, if not all of them, have gone the uh, pro-choice way, if you will. And what does this mean for the future of Republicans and politicians who uh, are on the right? How do you deal with this issue? Let's delve into that a little bit today, inspired by a conversation uh, with former President Donald Trump. A terrible mistake, says Donald Trump criticizing DeSantis on the abortion ban. Um, This was on, I believe, Meet the Press, which uh, has a new host. I don't know who it is. You're about to see the person, and then you can later tell me who this person is. But uh, here she is talking to Donald Trump about abortion. If a federal ban landed on your desk, if you were reelected, would you sign it at 15? Are you talking about a complete ban? A ban at 15 weeks. Well, people people are... Starting to think of 15 weeks, that seems to be a number that people are talking about right now. Would you sign that? Uh, uh, I would I would sit down with both sides and I'd negotiate something and we'll end up with peace on that issue for the first time in 52 years. Uh, I'm not going to say I would or I wouldn't. I mean, DeSantis w- is willing to sign a five-week and six-week ban. Would you support that? You think I, that I goes think what he far? did is a terrible thing and a terrible mistake. Terrible thing, a terrible mistake, a five to six week ban. Now, of course, they didn't go as far as, you know, other states like Texas have gone uh, with largely a complete ban of of abortion. But, you know, Florida being a somewhat purplish state until very recently, uh, you can understand maybe a five to six week uh, ban on the right being the target. Now, he said this was a terrible thing. Let let me give you a complete aside here for a second. I don't know if this is true or not. But what what does the DeSanctus thing mean? Does anyone know? I, I've yet to meet anyone who understands what De Sanctus is. De Sanctimonious, I get, right? He's calling him Sanctimonious, which, I don't know, it's one of the criticisms of Ron DeSantis. Okay. Um, you know, you know you would, of course, this is a thing that Trump does, comes up with nicknames. But why De Sanctus? Why does he always say De Sanctus and kind of interchangeably with Sanctimonious? Does anyone know? I would love to get your theories on this. I have a very weak theory, which is there was a, a, a casino executive in Atlantic City that was named De Sanctus. And I think he's just like used to using that name and it just blurted it out a few times and now just sticking with it. That's my theory. If you have a better one, drop it in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. I would love to know if anyone knows if there is an actual reason he uses the term dissectus. That's just a total aside, but I'm just interested. I'd just like to know. Um, Okay, so uh, this is very similar if you uh, got the approach there from uh, President Trump. Uh, as uh, Nikki Haley's uh, commentary on this from the debate. Haley calls for a consensus on the issue of abortion. As Pence says, that is the opposite of leadership. As for a federal ban, Haley said politicians need to be honest with the American people and say that it will take 60 Senate votes. It will take a majority of the House. So in order to do that, let's find consensus, she said. Can't we all agree that we should ban late-term abortions? Can't we all agree that we should encourage adoptions? Can't we all agree that doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? Can't we all agree that contraception should be available? And can we all agree that we are not going to put a woman in jail or have or give her the death penalty if she gets an abortion? I don't know that anyone's proposing that, but still. She added, let's treat this like the respectful issue that it is. 
and humanize this situation and stop demonizing the situation. Now, Don, Ron DeSantis has come out on the other side of that. DeSantis' campaign target, has targeted Trump over uh, his abortion comments. And this is because he's taking a pro-life view that 15 weeks or something where we can find consensus is not really that much of a pro-life position. Before we get into the politics of this, which I think is important, I'm not going to completely dismiss them, even though my heart wants to dismiss them when you're talking about the issue of life. We'll discuss them here in a second. But you should at least understand what this means. A 15-week ban, what does it mean? Here's a chart uh, with... Uh, how many abortions, what percentage of abortions happen at each individual week uh, throughout pregnancy? You'll see that the really high bars on the left before the 15-week line include uh, one to six weeks, which is about 34% of abortions. About 18 weeks, or 18% of abortions happen in week seven. About 13% of abortions happen in week eight. About 9% in week nine. And it keeps going on until you get down to about 15 weeks. And at no week after 15 do even 2% of abortions occur. Some of these numbers are rounded up, but the total number of abortions that happen after the 15th week is about 7%. So the, if the consensus number is that we ban 7% of the admittedly most egregious cases of abortion where babies are fully formed and such, is that enough for you? Is that pro-life enough that 93% of abortions continue? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. A lot of people would say, hey, that's enough for me. You know, like, obviously, we're talking about you know, abortions in the, the final month uh, of pregnancy. These are things that the left seems to still want to occur. And if that is all you're worried about, you can probably win a, a talking point against the left out of 15 weeks. Um, you know, I think a lot of this probably pretty conveniently lines up with polling, where the American people want abortion in the first uh, trimester and don't want it in the second and third trimester. So the Republicans are picking basically dead center of where voters are. They're saying, hey, we'll let you have them in the first uh, trimester, well, not in the second and not in the third. And, and vo voters overwhelmingly agree with that sentiment when it's not tied to a specific politician making it. If Donald Trump says that he wants that, they're all going to hate it. Uh, but generally speaking, when asked outside of the political realm, that's what they want. That's also what Europe has. So Europe has, you know, 10, 12, 14 week bans in most areas. And, uh, you know, our laws are already much more liberal or to the left of this. Now, is that a pro-life position, though? Is it a pro-life position to say only 7% of abortions are eliminated? What's the pro-life principle behind that? I mean, to me, the principle behind abortion is this sort of, I guess, crazy extremist idea that I want babies to live. I would like them to have a chance at life, to form a, an amazing life where they achieve all sorts of incredible things, or a real crap heap of a life where they're the people cutting you off in traffic. Whatever their terrible choices are, good choices, terrible choices, they, like you, should have an opportunity to live that life. To me, that seems like a real basic thing that we should all want. It doesn't seem like something that should be extreme, but I look at the polling, and I'm honest with you when I admit that my position is extreme in this country. If you happen to be a pro-life person and believe in the principles of life and want all life to be uh, treated as if it is important, well, you probably are in the extreme view as well. Most people want to have an out. Most people want to have an exception. If they make what they view as a mistake, uh, they want to be able to solve that mistake uh, by ending the life of another human being. You know, I don't I don't see that as a, as a viable option. And viable, it's not even all that important to me when it comes to uh, this particular issue. Viability might happen at 20 weeks, might happen a little bit earlier, maybe 20, maybe 18, maybe 24, somewhere in that range. And this would be before viability safely. Um, we would, a 15 week ban would do a lot. It would bring us back to essentially the initial vision of Roe versus Wade. That is the initial vision of that. There can be restrictions past 15 weeks, but anything up to the first trimester is the way they put it uh, in Roe versus Wade. That was something that was basically allowed for any reason. You know, we now have many states who are allowing uh, any reason, uh, any, uh, any reason at all for an abortion all the way up to birth. Colorado being one, uh, Maryland being another that basically does it. I mean, when you have a mental health exception, I mean, that's essentially what you're doing is you're allowing it all the way. So what's the right place? Now, Trump is offering something here that is not possible. 
I think we would all acknowledge that, and honestly, in private, he would acknowledge it as well. There is no way, there's no number you come to where everyone's happy, because if your number's not zero, I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to be happy. I know millions of people out there who support a pro-life vision of what we should do going forward and think abortion is a horrific uh, stain on our country. Uh, would it would agree with me and they're not going to be happy. So there's no there's no central point six even six weeks Which I think is at least a legally defensible line whether it's a morally defensible line is a whole nother story But a legally defensible line in that uh, it's about the heartbeat line You could say we end life uh, when a heartbeat stops Maybe you say life begins when a, when a heartbeat begins and you want to draw the line there It's at least a legally defensible position to take I don't think anything past that really is legally defensible, but okay, you want to take that position, fine. I tend to to think of this in a different way. But still, you're not going to make everybody happy there. The overwhelming majority of people are going to be opposed if you make it that restrictive. So what are you going to do? Well, this is a time where you would make a principled judgment and you would state that principled judgment. I mean, look, politicians have been mocked forever for giving this, you know, I'm watching the polls type of view. And I don't think it's a coincidence that both Haley and Trump's position happen to line up almost precisely with the polls. And I, you know, look, I don't think, I don't want Mike Pence to be the nominee either. Um, uh, You know, that's, I don't think he'd be the best choice per se. You know, you can kind of make your own judgment on who you think the best choice would be. But Pence's criticism there is spot on. I mean, it's not leadership for Haley or Trump to just kind of put their finger up in the wind and say, hey, let's find a number that everybody's happy with. I mean, there is, there's no such thing. And frankly, you know, if you're an organization that is looking to advance the issue of life, settling settling for a 15-week ban it's probably not the position you should put yourself in. I, I will say, like, I don't even know if a 15-week ban legally would work. We just had a Supreme Court ruling that said this is a state's decision. So I don't even know if it would legally hold muster. Um, I believe the solution to this issue is a constitutional amendment. And you might say, well, that's going to be really hard. Well, it should be really hard. If you're making a big change like this, it should be really hard. But uh, frankly, when it comes to the issue of life, it's worth the effort, I feel like. Uh, and my view is that every single year... There should be a constitutional amendment pushed forward by Republicans. And you know what? The media would get mean about it, and they would say how extreme we are. And we would say, you know what? We kind of think babies should be born. I know it's, it's weird. Uh, it's a strange position, apparently, uh, that you want children to have the chance to, to live lives. Uh, but whatever that is, I'll kind of take the political hit for that. And you know what? It won't pass the first year you put it up there, and it won't pass the second, and it probably won't pass the fifth or the tenth or the twentieth. But at some point, the American people will come to the realization that this is a horrific stain on our country, just like they did with the issue of slavery. And I do think that moment is coming. Now, the Susan B. Anthony, which is uh, um, uh, for Pro-Life America, is a good organization. I like them. They were asked about this, um, and they asked about uh, Trump calling a six-week ban terrible. They said, we're at a moment where we need a human rights advocate, someone who is dedicated to saving the lives of children and serving mothers in need. Every single candidate should be clear on how they plan to do that. It begins with focusing on the extremes on the other side and ambition and common sense on our own. Anything later than a 15-week protection for babies in the womb when science proves they can feel pain as a national minimum standard makes no sense. They went on to amend the statement, adding this. uh, We thank Governor Ron DeSantis for allowing the science and the will of the people by signing the Heartbeat Protection Act into law. So they're basically saying, okay, 15-week ban, better than nothing. We should at least limit it there if we can. Uh, But states should go farther, and DeSantis obviously did go farther. It's not a horrible thing. Like, if you're a pro-life person saying that six weeks, which, by the way, is a significant period of time. I mean, there's a morning-after pill that exists. If you really need to have an abortion and you're not 100% sure or you really think you're on that line, I guess you could probably get it done. Uh, Over a third of abortions are done in that period anyway. Again, am I happy as a pro-life person that two-thirds of abortions would, uh, would be wiped out, but a third would remain? No. Of course, we also would have to acknowledge that many of the abortions that happened in the weeks, you know, week seven and week eight would be moved up to week six. So I wouldn't be happy with that either. And uh, that, so that number would I likely go up. And of course, even if you banned it completely, we all know that people are going to get pills ma- mailed in from India and other places around the globe. And abortions will still continue. The goal here, of course, is to change people's hearts and people's minds. That's the only way you win a battle like this. 
Um, the long-term progress of truly pro-life people is not just the law. It's not even just a constitutional amendment. All of this is part of the process. The 14th Amendment uh, and the, the amendments around slavery are crucial. They're, I'm, I'm glad they're there and they should be there. And they were necessary, by the way. They needed to be there. I'm glad they were. Um, however, that's not the end of the road. It's convincing people to look at abortion like they do slavery. If slavery was made legal again today, very few people would want to participate in it. Why? We look at it as an abhorrent process, a terrible stain on our past. And we, we realize the consternation it's causing even, even to this day uh, where people are still debating it and still blaming it for all sorts of problems. It's a horrible, horrible thing. And imagine all the people we've lost to abortion, far more numerous than were ever involved in the slave trade. Yes, we need to take every little step we can forward to stop this process, in my view. And I think that there's an easy way to talk about this if you're a politician. You want to say, look, this is an issue that was set to the states, and that's where it should remain until we can amend the Constitution to go farther. And I believe eventually that would be a great outcome. But I also realize we do need a consensus, not a for false one negotiated by both sides of the aisle and politicians behind closed doors to come up with some magical number of weeks, but an actual consensus by the country. And the country has that right now uh, on something like slavery. That same thing eventually will come, I believe, when it comes to the issue of abortion, but it's going to take a long time. Um, you know, look, Donald Trump, a lot of people were calling us out. They're like, oh, how come you're not talking about this? How come you're not talking about the abortion thing with Donald Trump? Well, first of all, it happened this weekend, so this is our first show. I do think it's important to talk about, and I will talk about it. Um, but Trump has a complicated, it's complicated when it comes to Trump. Trump's personal position on abortion has never been that strong. I don't think people ever elected the guy because of his position on abortion. He's never been a real social conservative in a meaningful way. But at the end of the day, he is largely responsible for the most um, significant pro-life achievement in the last 50 years. So it's a complicated relationship. I don't think he's going to lose a lot of people uh, to Joe Biden over his stances. And this may very well be what he's, be what he's doing. He's negotiating publicly. He's taking a position out there to, uh, to, uh, to try to win over moderate voters. Uh, it seemed to work for Nikki Haley in the debate when I didn't think it would. Maybe we will see that be the majority position for Republicans for a long time. But that doesn't make it right. We're talking about the life of children here. And if you can't lead and you can't come out and say, I want babies to have a chance to live, I don't know where you can stand up and take a stand. Tax policy is important. This is far more important. And it's something we need leadership on for not just one election, but for years and decades and maybe centuries to follow. Because no matter how many elections you lose, it will always be worth fighting for the issue of children being allowed to live. Well, let's talk about the economy for a second. It's not looking so great. Uh, Vladimir Putin called the U.S. dollar's drop in dominance objective and irreversible. Uh, the BRICS summit that they have, South Africa and Brazil and Russia and India and China and South Africa, they formally agreed to use local currencies instead of the U.S. dollar. This is one of the first steps in down a, uh, a scary path for the United States. As demand for the dollar weakens, the buying power of the dollar weakens. And that's why Birch Gold Group is busier than ever. Investors and savers are looking to harness the power of physical gold held in a tax-sheltered IRA. Text STU to the number 989898. You'll get the free info kit on gold. Thousands of happy customers, A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews. You can count on Birch Gold to help you navigate transitioning an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. As the U.S. dollar continues to receive pressure from foreign countries, digital currency, and central banks, arm yourself with information on how to protect your savings. Just text STU to the number 989898. That's my name, STU, to the number 989898 to, free, to uh, get your free info kit right now from Birch Gold. Oh, it's great to be joined by Sarah Gonzalez, of course, the host of the News and Why It Matters, right here on Blaze TV. Make sure not to miss a single episode. Uh, Sarah. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy Monday. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to, you actually had a pretty happy weekend, I feel like. I did. we were heavily invested in what was going on in Texas. Let me give the big reveal tweet. This is how I learned the news, by the way. Uh, this tweet, breaking, Ken Paxton 
You got and a siren. You had a siren yes, on there. That siren. makes it very important. <laughs> Ken Paxton has been acquitted on all impeachment charges. Our boy is coming back to fight for the state of Texas as he always has. Praise God. Uh, this is a big story here in Texas. I don't know that it was a, a massive story nationwide. I don't know how much people knew about it, mm -hmm. um, but it was a it was in doubt for a while. Like I, I mean, Republicans yeah. were on board with his impeachment and removal. It seemed like for a while. In the end, it wasn't all that close, was it? Yeah, and, and I would say, too, um, it wasn't a nationwide story, but I think it should have been mm. because I think that there would have been nationwide implications had they jammed this impeachment through and gotten away with removing him. So I think the disconnect is you're looking at a fractured uh, Texas legislature. You're looking at a Texas House that is run by Speaker of the House, Dade Phelan, who, you know, refuses to, oh, I don't know, take up school choice or uh, border security mm. or banning Chinese ownership of Texas land, things that actual conservatives want, and instead puts all his eggs in the basket of let's impeach the most conservative attorney general in the entire country, which is just bizarre when you think about it, right? It is bizarre. It's bizarre, I think, from outsiders um, that look at Texas and think, okay, well, it's a big bright red state. It's Texas. You get the hats. You get the swagger. But in a way, because it's so red, mm -hmm. no one even attempts to run as a Democrat. And so the people who might be Democrats in other states wind up, you know, worming their way into the Republican primaries, win those primaries and then stay in power forever, even though they vote uh, sometimes a lot like Democrats. Is that what happened here? We had the power structure that came after um, uh, the attorney general. Just this group of like rhino y type of Republicans, not really Republican. Yes, yeah, I would say absolutely. And I mean, to your point, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the Speaker of the House, Dade Phelan, ran last year unopposed as a Republican. So he didn't have anyone primarying him and mm. holding him accountable because I think that, to your point, Texans for so long have stayed in this red bubble where they go, well, we're Texas. We're always going to be conservative. Right. And they're, they're completely inactive in any of the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, case in point, you know, I have people, our friend Chad Prather, he's, of course, also a host here. Yeah. And we had people all the time. I came out for Chad and, and I endorsed him. And people said, well, you're going to steal votes away and the Democrats going to win. Just absolutely no clue that there was a primary process. Wow. right? And then the people said, well, if anyone more conservative than Abbott were running, we would have voted for them. Okay, well, there were, there were. more conservative yeah. people, and you clearly didn't participate in the primary process. So I think that a lot of that can be placed at the, the feet of the voters for not being active, for not paying attention, for not participating in the primary process. And then we have such low turnout in the primaries that we get stuck with people like Dade Phelan and Andrew Murr, mm. who try to impeach a, an attorney general who is fighting for the great state of Texas. And also, you know, quite frankly, I believe that it was all political retribution. Mm. Well, yeah, because that's an interesting part of this. The, the, the political retribution is interesting here, because if I'm not mistaken, you help me with the timeline sure. here. But right before the impeachment thing happened, this is right after, by the way, um, Paxton won re-election. Mm -hmm. They there was a controversy in which Paxton was one of the people calling out the Speaker of the House for what seemed like a drunken appearance in front uh, a front of the legislature. Like it yeah. seemed like he, the guy, dude was hammered yes. giving a speech. I mean, what, you go back and watch it. He's slurring words. It seems like he was hammered. Now look. I would not be surprised at all. We all know that every politician seems to have some sort of alcohol problem. That seems that's very well covered. Not everyone, but a lot of them do. It's a stressful job, not to excuse it, but it does seem to, to draw in the alcoholics at a higher percentage than the average population. Um, so this would not be shocking. Right. In fact, it would not even be the most disturbing thing I've ever heard out of a politician. <laughs> uh, but it definitely did seem like it was real by visual cues. Yeah. And right after this, right after he called him out, Surprisingly, this is when the impeachment thing started. Do I have that right? Yes, you do. It was it was 48 hours after okay. Ken Paxton called <laughs> Don't for make it obvious, right? Dade, right, Dade yeah. Phelan's uh, resignation that you had any. I mean, you cannot you cannot find any member of the Texas legislature before Ken Paxton called for Dade Phelan to resign over that, <laughs> calling for Ken Ken Paxton to be impeached. None of them. None of them did it. None of them. And then now, they, a now lot Democrats of them. always have, right? Yeah, but right. no Republican in office had called for that. Until Ken Paxton called out Dade Phelan. For being drunk. Yes, on the House floor and conducting business, by the way. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's in the middle of session where they are conducting business and passing bills. And the guy has to 
hold himself up with one hand because he's so hammered he can't stand up straight. <laughs> We've all been there. I mean, <laughs> speaking of that, Power Hour is coming up next week uh, right here on Blaze TV. We'll tell you more about that here in a little bit. Because um, <laughs> we'll be doing it, but we're doing it on the job, and it's sort of allowed. That's our, our out. Um, but it's interesting because, like, you know, I was talking to a, fr a friend of mine texted me right after this news broke, and he said, uh, you know, he's not from Texas, a conservative guy, but, you know, doesn't follow this stuff all that, you know, closely Texas politics. And he said, I just saw the Paxton thing break. Should I be happy or sad for this news? Like, mm. you know, is this guy a good guy or a bad guy? And I was like, he's a good guy. Yeah. But make that case to the American people. People don't know, you know, they might not know who Ken Paxton is. Why should we care if Ken Paxton gets impeached or not? Well, I mean, look, he is, again, I, I would argue, the most conservative attorney general, the biggest conservative fighter in the country when it comes to uh, fighting the Biden regime for their overreach of power, for their abuse of power. Um, he has filed more lawsuits than any other attorney general against all of Biden's, uh, you know, the, whether it be the border, whether it be uh, looking into big pharma. I mean, he really is at the helm uh, leading the charge for conservatives in the fight. Um, now, I will also say, so that in itself is a good thing, yeah, right? He, if, yeah, if you're he's a, a good attorney general he's, from a conservative perspective. He's yes. aggressive. Yes. He's, he's, yes. His name is usually on every one of these lawsuits mm -hmm. you see go up to the Supreme Court. That, you know, he, he's, in, he's in that fight every single day and doesn't seem to mind making enemies doing it. Right. Correct. Exactly. On top of that, this sent a resounding message that if any state, any local authority, any you know officials wanted to use this process to abuse the impeachment process in their state and remove duly elected officials, that, I mean, Ken Paxton was just voted in by 4.2 million Texans. And the House impeachment managers said, screw you guys, we want him out. We don't care that you guys just voted him in, knowing all of these allegations. Mm -hmm. We want him out anyway, because he is a threat to the establishment. They wanted to jam it through anyway. So I think what else this did was send a resounding message to any other states who were watching this going, maybe this could be a thing that we could try to get out all of these you know, grassroots conservatives disrupting our establishment here. Um, it sent a resounding message that you can't do that. You, yeah. you can't abuse the process. The process is there for a reason. And, you know, Ken Paxton had his day or weeks in court. The evidence was not there. And quite frankly, they ended up embarrassing all of the House that ended up voting to jam this impeachment through and set it on the Senate's lap only for there to be absolutely no evidence. Yeah, because I remember in the House, 60 Republicans yes. voted for him to yes. be impeached. I mean, like there was a bit of a movement on the Republican side early. Why did that fail? I mean, you think you get 60 people from re from the Republican side to vote for something, you're going to have no problem getting it through the Texas Senate. Why was it such a failure? I mean, I think it all goes to the speaker's lack of leadership, or I should say he led them, but he led them off of a cliff. So <laughs> yeah. he, so, he tried yeah. to, to convince, and I guess was successful in convincing 60 House Republicans in Texas that they had all the evidence they needed, that it was a slam dunk case, even though the House investigators did not have anyone testify under oath, right? They did not, mm. they did all of this process in secret. It felt the, like it was so rushed when it happened. It was, it was. And all of that was done on purpose so that no, all of these Republicans would go, oh, well, Speaker told me that this is the case. I mean, we should vote for it because if it's as bad as he says it is, we got to get this guy out of office. He's totally and completely corrupt. And then, of course, the Senate followed the process and followed the facts and followed the evidence and found out that these were all baseless allegations. I mean, these... Uh, these House Republicans who were giving all of these salacious headlines like, oh, my gosh, it, the evidence is 10 times worse than you think it is. We've seen it and it's 10 times worse. I mean, they might as well be working for Texas Tribune. Yeah, it, it, that, that's how bad it was. Yeah, because I mean, you, and it's like it's a tough thing because when someone who maybe you know, some of the voters may have even voted for right, the a Republican, they vote for him. Uh, as you point out, unopposed, they probably did vote for this guy. And you go through that process and he's now misled you with this promise of information that he has that you don't have. We've seen this, I mean, throughout COVID, certainly plenty of times where there was always a, you know, a medical expert to tell you all the stuff that you you didn't know about yet, but you will eventually. Don't worry about it. And that's a real problem, right? Like you shouldn't be stuck in that position where you're trying to cast a vote. Uh, without the information that you need. And I was amazed watching some of the clips of this where the actual witness for the impeachment, people who are in favor of the yes, impeachment, yes. they would be asked, well, what evidence do you have? 
And they would say, well, we don't have any evidence, but we decided to go forward with it because we thought it happened. Yeah. And there it's not that's not the accusation. That's the people who are defending right. the impeachment. Right. I mean, it seemed like this went off the rails almost immediately when they when they looked at it closely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I mean, I think that uh, there were a lot of uh, Texas, again, Texas Tribune, Dallas Morning News, I mean, these left-leaning organizations, yeah. these rags that were trying to, to somehow make the point that Ken Paxton has to prove that he's innocent. That's not the case. The prosecution had a burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt to prove that Ken Paxton was guilty all of these things, of all of these things, and they simply did not meet the burden, so much so that the defense was making embarrassing all of these prosecution witnesses by pointing out, as you mentioned, there was absolutely no evidence. It was just like, well, I heard from a guy who heard from another guy who heard from another guy that he did something really bad, so I went to the FBI. I mean, that, that's really like... That's not how our system works, No, I don't think. and so, you know, you had to the point where the defense was, I mean, if you were to listen and not know who was who, you would think that these were defense witnesses that were up on the stand, but really they were the prosecutions because that's how weak their case was mm. at the end of the day. The defense didn't have to prove anything, but I think that they did. That's amazing. I, I, I was watching some of them and you're like, they're like, well, one of the pieces of proof we have are these countertops that were switched out. And then the countertops weren't switched out. They weren't switched right? Like, out. I was, when you watch this, like, I know, yeah. obsessively. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was you, I was seeing you walking down the halls. You're listening to testimony. You can't talk to anybody. It was, I mean, you really were, you really did cover this really well. Yeah. What were some of the craziest pieces of evidence? What were the moments of the trial that people may have missed? Well, the, the one that you mentioned was <laughs> great because you have this witness. He's on the stand. He's the guy that believed that Ken Paxton was bribed by his friend Nate Paul buying him these elaborate, expensive granite countertops. And they showed him these comparison pictures of the countertops before and the countertops after, and they were the exact same countertops, which, by the way, <laughs> I think we should start a crowdfund for Angela Paxton to get new yeah, granite countertops. Yeah. I think she deserves them I after all so. of this. Yeah. But he looks at the two pictures, and he tells the attorneys that the issue is, quote, put to bed for him. I mean, you this, this guy who has just... The whole reason that we're alleging that the, the attorney general is being accused of a bribery is because this guy thought he saw something who now on the stand says, let's put to bed for me. Another, another Amazing. exchange. Meaning, meaning it wasn't not, true. He realized it wasn't true. He realized true. it was not, he realized it was not true. And he said, I'm satisfied. I don't think he did it. <laughs> I mean, this, when does this happen? It's I, like, it's like a bad episode of Law and Order. I know, but, I know. And then on top of that, you have almost every single one of these whistleblowers who gets on the stand and says, I emphatically and wholeheartedly trust the FBI. I've not thought of anything within the last couple of years that the FBI has done to make me not trust them. Yeah. Really? That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, it's one of the things where like impeachment is part of the process, right? Like if we, you know, people yeah. believe that there's something wrong, you can impeach someone and that is part of the process. It goes back to the founders. But another, I would argue, more important process is to be able to put it in front of the, uh, the, the American people or in this in this case, the, the Texas voters, yeah. who had this opportunity. They had this chance very recently to take him out in either the primary or in the general election. And in both cases said, no, he's our guy. Mm -hmm. And Republicans, it's important to understand, Republicans decided to override their own voters and say, just after the election, just after they had said, with all this stuff on the table, that these are, he's our guy to try to take him out. That's, our, that's quite a statement for Texas. Yeah, so much so that Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, of course, was presiding over this trial as the judge. And they were under gag order, so he mm -hmm. couldn't say anything during the entire process after it was over. He blasted yeah. the Texas House. He called for them to amend the Texas Constitution to strengthen the impeachment process language so that this never happens to a Texas official again. And he called for a full audit of how much mm. taxpayer money the Texas House spent on the sham of a process. I mean, that that is how bad that is how bad this process was. Mm. Uh, let me give you this last one here uh, before we go. Uh, this is a Wall Street Journal editorial board um, op ed about Ken Paxton. And, you know, Wall Street Journal, well, you'd say the editorial page, right, but establishment, right, right yeah. generally speaking. Yeah. They write, uh, Mr. Paxton's defenders are spitting that he was saved by a populist national conservative groundswell to put an end to a Bush era in Texas. What a joke. There is no longer a Bush era in Texas or anywhere else. George P. Bush, Jeb Bush's son, lost to Mr. Paxton in the 2022 primary for AG. What really happened Saturday is Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who runs the state Senate, cho chose to rescue Mr. Paxton in a <laughs> rebuke to his rival, House Speaker Dade uh, Phelan. Um, all politics is very local here. Is that true? Because, I mean, that is not, that's not what I got out of this process at all. 
No, that's the spin that a bunch of babies who uh, can't handle the results of a trial. You know, yeah. they always want to accuse Republicans of not being able to handle the results of things. Well, yeah. they don't want to handle the results of uh, this man got his day in court. Um, these were the jurors. They heard the evidence. There was no backdoor deals being done. They're just literally was no evidence to prove that he had done these things, especially not beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and I think it's laughable yeah. that they think that Dan Patrick had anything to do with it. I mean, doesn't it kind of prove the point, too, where, like, yes, Bush lost to Paxton, but that's why they were pissed. Yes. Right? Like, George P. Bush was the last guy who was going to kind of keep the Bush thing going here in Texas. He's, he took him out really the last time he had a, a high-profile opportunity at office, probably. And they seemed like this was revenge. Yes. And remember... The same exact day that the whistleblowers went to the FBI in 2020, uh, George P. Bush happened to renew his law license that he had let lapse for 10 entire years and then months later announced that he was running against Ken Paxton as a, for attorney general. Mm, that's convenient. Mm, that's very, very, very convenient. Well, thank you so much for following this so closely because as I, I mentioned up there, I'm like, I kind of crappy at following local politics. Like I'm following the national stuff very closely, but sometimes I lose Texas. Sarah's always here to take care of that for me. So thank you so much, Sarah. Appreciate Thank it. you. Sarah Gonzalez, make sure to catch her right here on Blaze TV, the news and why it matters. And uh, Sarah, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks. So if you've ever bought or sold a home, you know how crazy it can be. You know, you got to have someone on your side of the transaction. I, I remember when I was first looking to buy my first home, I was like, what do you do to find a real estate agent? I guess you go and you look at the listing and whoever is selling the house, you just go with them, right? Well, no, you want someone on your side. You want a buying agent on your side. Whether you're buying or selling a home, no matter where you are in the country, realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find the best agent in your area. Glenn Beck started this program or this uh, company years ago because he had an experience of his own that he wanted to try to solve. And, the, you know, he talked to, you know, some people who are actually smart around him uh, that could create a business, uh, unlike him. And uh, they said, hey, well, what about a website where we can sort through these people and have the best people available? You go there, you give them some information, they put you in touch with the best agent in your area. The best part, it's free to you. So why wouldn't you take advantage of this? Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find the best agent in your area. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Hunter Biden has sued the Internal Revenue Service on Monday. Who knew you could do that? I mean, I kind of just want to do it because they're annoying. I didn't even know you could do this. Um, alleging that agents illegally released his tax information and that the agency failed to protect his private records. This is a masterful uh, sense of irony coming from Hunter Biden, considering, of course, his dad is running against a guy who has had his tax returns released like every single year of them over and over and over again. And they've been poured through uh, Donald Trump, who decided he didn't want to release them himself. Instead, they just did it without without uh, any right to do it. And, and everyone seemed to get access to them anyway. And they, we called that investigation journalism. That's what that one was uh, for some reason. But he's very upset about that. And I, you know, look, I am along with you, very upset and feel terrible for poor Hunter on that one. Uh, DNC committee member is saying that he is perplexed by polls showing that Biden is struggling to rally Democrats around his reelection bid. He says a big part of it is just pure ageism. Uh, this is uh, uh, obviously ridiculous, but I do think it's going to be something that they're going to try here as we get closer and closer to the election. And instead of it being an obvious thing that everyone should worry about, that the president of the United States can't seem to get through multiple sentences in a row or stand for three to four minutes at a time without falling over, uh, this is going to be instead a big thing where it's like, oh, you just don't like him because of its age. And it, yes, I know it sounds stupid. And it would make a little bit more sense if Ron DeSantis was the nominee, which who knows, he may still be. But at this point, he's trailing by a lot. Um, so you're telling me it's ageism that they're voting for a 77 year old against an 81 year old. Like, I don't even understand, like what even in theory, what sense would that make? Right. Like, I, can you come up with a plausible thought process that would lead that? Uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe the line is 80. Is that the age of like, anyone before 80 is fine, but anyone after 80 isn't? I don't even know what the line of it there is. And I will say Democrats seem like they're gris grasping at straws here and they are. But that's because no one believes in this president uh, and no one believes he's physically capable or mentally capable of doing this. And that's not exactly true. But 34 percent, 34 percent of voters think Biden would complete the second term if reelected. 
they're not saying he'd thrive and do a great job, but 34% think he'll make it to the end of his second term. This is like, this is like a coach saying, well, we might not you know, win any games this year, but only 34% believe they'll even make it to the last game. Like, I, I don't know. People would just think he'd be quitting in midseason. Um, this is uh, amazing, honestly, and it shows how sad our system has become that we're putting faith in someone like this to lead our nation. It's an embarrassment, and it is a massive problem. It's probably, take the economy out, take all the other stuff that Joe Biden has done out of the picture for a second. It's probably the biggest thing that Democrats need to deal with, the fact that no one believes uh, their candidate has any level of mental acuity to actually do the job. They're going to roll out every single excuse, and I guess ageism is just the latest one. What's today's date? Anyone know? I mean, we're getting pretty close. So Saturday, September 23rd is your opportunity to own prime Texas acreage at wholesale prices. I guess Saturday, this is this Saturday, right? We're only a few days away from this. I got to introduce you to the Overlook at Richland Chambers, where you can find never before offered two to four acre uh, lake estates for only $79,900. Come see uh, why this is the best wholesale value in the state of Texas. On Saturday, September 23rd, you could also own a rare eight plus acre direct dockable property with over 545 feet. That's a lot of feet. That's bigger than a football field. 545 feet of shoreline for only $199,900. Less than an hour from Dallas, only two hours from Houston. These properties are serviced and pay with paved roads and utilities. By now, you have the freedom to choose your own builder and build when you're ready. Located in the mecca of outdoor activities, including some of the best fishing in Texas. There's a huge demand for lake property here in Texas with breathtaking lake views. This is the perfect second home retirement or full-time lake living, plus no HOA. And that's always nice. No HOA. Buy directly from the developer and save thousands on September 23rd. That's this Saturday. These properties are wholesale price to sell in one day. Don't miss out. 765 Lake Now is the number. 765 Lake Now or online at txlakefront.com. Txlakefront.com. Check it out now. It's txlakefront.com. Well, it's time to celebrate, America. We've done it again. Great job, everybody. We've harassed a celebrity into uh, losing his gig. Uh, this is great. We talked about this last week. Ashton Kutcher, uh, the celebrity, um, he came out and he wrote a letter for his friend who was accused of rape. Uh, he was going to prison for either 15 or 30 years to life. He wrote a letter that said, well, my experiences with him was there's no rape involved. In fact, he was actually uh, quite nice to me. And uh, that has now led to him having to step down from his own sex trafficking organization. So all the money and attention he could have brought to help stop sex trafficking has now been derailed, and uh, the organization's probably going to fold in a couple of months now that they don't have their lead spokesperson. And we can all celebrate the fact that that money will no longer go to sex trafficking prevention. Instead, we could all feel good about tweeting our disgust about a guy's letter about his friend. So we've won, America. All those kids will be in sex slavery, but you won a Twitter fight. Good job, boys and girls. I think this is working out just is fine. We've got a big announcement coming up tomorrow. We'll give it to you then. Uh, make sure to subscribe. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. Promo code is Stu.